posted a video in about a week. Uh, I've had a case of bronchitis that keeps lingering with me, and every time I talk a lot or talk too much, it seems to bring it back. So I'm feeling a little better now, so I'm going to try to post a few more videos here. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, components. And I, I got a lot of, I did this last video on inclined planes, and I got a lot of emails about how did you find the components of that. And uh, so I want to take this opportunity now to create a video that's going to talk just about components and systems and how do we define them. Um, so I'm going to talk about just a basic XY system, a basic uh, coordinate system on a flat surface, let's just say with an object. And then I'm going to talk about <clears throat> free body diagrams and the components on inclined planes. And then I'm going to talk about a pendulum. So typically when we're dealing with a, a system, let's just say, and I have a, a, an object here, let's just say that there's a force acting on that system and that force is acting, let's say, in this direction. Typically when you define an axis, <clears throat> you want to define it in such a way that it's going to be aligned with the net force. So let's just say that there's one force acting on this object. What I'm going to do is I'm going to define my x and my y coordinate system to be exactly with that net force, whatever direction the net force is. So even if there was another force in this direction, let's just say uh, going against it just with a little bit less energy, I still would define my uh, positive x direction in the, in the direction of the net force. So let's just say that I had a force here. Let's just say I had a force applied of, I don't know, let's just say 10 newtons here. And let's say that I had a force of some force of friction, which I'm drawing uh, not at the surface, even though it's acting there. I'm just going to draw it up here. Let's just say that that was uh, two newtons, right? So I know that my net force is going to be um, in the, the direction to the right. So I always want to pick my x-axis in the direction of the net force, okay? So that's pretty basic. I mean, usually um, on this flat surface, it's pretty easy to see that, okay? So that's, that's the first thing when we're talking about components. Uh, but what if we had a component that was at an angle? Let's just say that I had, let's say a vector like this. Let's say I had a force applied. Let's say you're pulling on a dog leash and there's a dog there you're pulling on the dog, and let's say you're putting a force applied of, I don't know, 50 newtons, let's just say. You're pulling at an angle, and you want to know what are those components. How do you find those components? Well, there's typically a default, which is this. When I'm finding my components, my x component and my y component like this, okay, I always want to define, if I can, my angle to the horizontal. So basically, here's my theta here. I want to define that angle to this horizontal here, because when I do that, my x component here is simply going to be force applied times the cosine of theta. Okay, And my y component here is simply going to be f of a times the sine of theta. And that's that's what we call a default. Okay, default. Now do you have to draw it to the horizontal every time? No you don't. You could have drawn it to the vertical, right? So the vertical would have been 90 minus theta, right? But that would have changed everything. If I took it, now the cosine is no longer going to be the x, and the sine is no longer going to be the y if I use 90 minus theta, right? So everything in math, we try to keep alphabetical. So x comma y, x comes before y, right? OK, if you're dealing with real and imaginaries, or even if you're dealing with vector components, you have i and you have j, that's alphabetical, right? you have, and that could be polar coordinates too, and then we have cosine and sine, and that's alphabetical, right? So we try to keep this default whenever we can, okay? So most of the time, my x component's gonna be cosine, okay? Because we can choose the angle most of the time, right? So even if I knew, let's say I knew that this angle was 40, right? I can choose to use this one as 50 because I can control what's happening. And then once I, by the way, once I have these components, I basically want to strike out that the other force. I want to strike it out just to show that it's no longer in existence. I have my x and my y. So that's pretty basic. That's a default uh, to define an axis and then to create my x and my y and my x is typically the default is going to be the cosine and my y is the default is going to be the sine because I'm going to define it to the horizontal. When I say horizontal I mean this, the horizon. Okay, the, the what you see right here across this x-axis. So most people don't have a problem with that. That's pretty basic. 
That's just how we define our components and we're going to use that system over and over again. This is how the unit circle works too in pre-calculus and calculus and trigonometry. We define everything to the horizontal or the horizon, okay? But when we get into inclined planes and pendulums, it's going to get a little bit different. And so I, you know, I typically tell people just remember as a default that the x is going to be cosine and the y is going to be sine because we can define that. But there are some exceptions, okay? And there's more than the, these two that I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to talk about these two because they're important. Um, the first one is going to be uh, inclined planes. An inclined plane is just a plane where it's tilted. So inclined planes is the first one. The second one is going to be pendulums. And when I say exceptions, what I mean is that the, the x component in this case is going to be the sine and the y component is going to be the cosine in this case in both of these. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why that's true. They, in other words, they flip around on these two situations, the inclined planes and the pendulums. The x is no longer the cosine. The x is going to be the sine and the y is going to be the cosine. So I'm going to show you why that's true. Uh, these are the two most common exceptions. Now, there's always other exceptions. I mean, when we get into any kind of complex geometry, it's very possible that the x could become the, the, you know, the sine and the y the, y the cosine. But these are the two most popular exceptions. So let's start looking first at the concept of the inclined plane um, where the, the x and the y will switch. We're going to be using the sine and the x and the, and the, um, and the y. We're going to use the cosine. So this first example here is going to be an inclined plane. Okay, for the, So for those of you who know a little bit about it, this is going to be just the basic geometry of inclined planes. Okay, So this is inclined planes. And all that that means is that the plane which the object is on, inclined plane, is going to be tilted up like this. So I'm going to put an angle like this theta. And we have some forces. Okay, let's just say there's no friction here. I'm just going to draw all the forces that are acting on this object. Let's just say that I have a force of gravity going down and I have the force normal coming up, whatever that is. Okay. So we know that I'm going to get two components here. In other words, well, we don't know yet. Let's, let, let me define my, my axis first here. Sorry about that. Let's go back and define our axis. So these are our forces acting on this object. But how do I define my axis? Well, I'm going to define my axis in the direction of the net force. So I could have my axis here and here because my net force is actually going to be along this x direction here. And I'm going to show you why in a second. So here's the y and here's the x. Okay, so if I took this force here and I drew its two components, I'm going to draw them in terms of the, the triangle here. If I resolve these here like this, I have two components, one this way and one this way, right? One in the y and one in the x, okay? So that's clear. I mean, we can see that this, obviously this box, if we let it go, it's going to want to slide down this inclined plane like this, okay? So that, that x component is actually going to end up being like this, so my net force is actually going to be to the left and it's going to be going downhill like this, okay? But the question is, how do I find out what this angle is right here? In other words, of this triangle? Because we know that we know that just from using basic geometry that this is the uh, the magnitude, so it's the hypotenuse. So this is going to be 90, we know that. But the question is, what is the value of this angle? So that's that's what we need to answer first. So we need to know that before we can figure out it, what if, if it's going to be sine or cosine. So some people just by looking at the at the similar triangles here that we have can can deduce if you have the picture drawn correctly that this is going to be theta. But that's not enough because I want to show you, I want to prove it to you that that's going to be theta. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so what I've done here is I've just drawn some lines that are parallel. One of them is parallel to the surface of this inclined plane, which probably I could do a little bit of a better job with that, but that's parallel to the surface of this inclined plane. Okay, And this line is parallel to the floor, basically right there. So what I'm doing is, let's just say that I had a, uh, a simple um, inclined plane okay, here, and let's say that I drew two uh, parallel lines to the base of that inclined plane. That's all that I did. You see there's a line here and there's a line here. So what do we know about um, parallel lines and 
angles within those parallel lines? Well, we know that there's geometry that exists between them. In other words, I can use corresponding angles. If there's a transversal that cuts two parallel lines, I can use alternate interior, I can use alternate exterior, I can use corresponding angles. There's a lot of things that I can do um, when I'm dealing with parallel lines cut by a uh, trans transversal, basically. So um, if I extend this down all the way, basically down to here, coming up here parallel with this, if I extend this out a little further here, I, I sorry, I extended this out so you can see it. Basically, what I've done is I've drawn a line that's parallel to this, okay, into the ground, and I'm kind of running out of space here. So if it's not exactly to scale, hopefully you'll understand why. Um, but I'm going to draw a line here. I'm going to draw, and, and this this is parallel to this, and this is this this is a transversal right here, okay, that will cut these two parallel lines of the base of the triangle. So this is going to be theta here, okay, like this. Now, if I went ahead and came up here with this, these two parallel lines here, by this uh, cut by this transversal, you can see that this is also theta here. Okay, and so right away I'm starting to see some similarities here between these these angles. But I don't care about this angle; I care about this one, right? Okay. So what is this angle right here? I'm going to draw it in a different color so you can see. But basically, this makes 90 degrees, right? So this right here, this is 90 minus theta, okay, right there. You can see that very clearly. So in other words, the I'm just showing you the geometry here. These two right here make 90 degrees. So if that's theta, this is 90 minus theta, okay? Now, this one right here, okay, I'm going to draw it in red so you can see it. This makes 90 degrees too. So, if, in a, so this makes 90. So if this is 90 minus theta, this is theta right there. Okay, so that's the geometry of how to get that from um, using uh, similar triangles and, and parallel lines. Now it's pretty it's pretty basic because I know that this is going to be the normal here, and this is going to be gravity here. Okay, so now you can see that this is on the opposite side of the triangle, so this component is going to be f g sine theta here, and this is going to be f g cosine theta. Okay. And so they've switched, right? We talked about this before. Now in the x direction, I have sine in that direction. In the, in the y direction, I have cosine, right? So this is why they switch. All you need to remember, though, basically, you can just remember, OK, that's theta. You can solve it. Or if you just want to speed it up, you can say, in inclined planes, I know that the x component is the sine of theta, or fg times the sine of theta. So that's just kind of where that comes from. You can just memorize that, though. I mean, you can always just. Like I said, you can just kind of go with that and say, okay, well, this is the this is the x component here, and I know that that's going to be simply that's just going to be f g sine theta there, and I know the the y component is going to be f g cosine theta. So when you see me doing this in proofs, right, you'll see me doing this, and I'll just kind of I just kind of will glance over that step, and I strike this main force out here, and I just sometimes I'll just write it like that. But that's the geometry. That's how you figure out what it is.